Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've, uh, we've saved the best for last right here with our uh, final speaker. And, you know, we talked earlier about uh, democratic coup d'etats that, you know, if you have the right circumstances, they, they seem to work. Uh, this is going to be a different look at a different technique of how does civil resistance work uh, when folks are interested in a change. And we literally have the expert to, uh, to tell us about that and to have us think about that. I think it's certainly important for military policy makers to consider this when they start to begin making decisions about whether to support a certain movement or how to do that or whether to leave it alone. So let me tell you a little bit about Maria Stefan. She directs the program on nonviolent action at the U.S. Institute of Peace. She has an illustrious background that includes serving as a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, the lead foreign affairs officer in the U.S. State Department's Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, where she worked on both policy and operations for the Afghanistan and Syria engagements. And she's also director of policy and research at the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. Maria has also worked with the European NATO Policy Office of the U.S. Department of Defense and at NATO headquarters in Brussels. Her book co-authored with Erica Chenoweth, Why Civil Resistance Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict, was actually awarded the 2012 Woodrow Wilson Foundation Prize as the best book published in political science. Her articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, Defense One and NPR. She's the recipient of the Harry S. Truman and William Fulbright National Scholarships, a graduate of Boston College and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and a lifetime member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stefan. Well, thanks very much for that kind introduction, uh, Colonel Athens. It's really a pleasure to have been invited to speak at this conference. Um, it's a little uh, daunting, I suppose, to be the final speaker of the conference, but I hope everybody's energy level is still there and you can uh, make it through one more, one more set of remarks. Um, and I also realize that I'm probably the only thing between you all and both a, an early happy hour and a lovely weekend. So I'll try to keep it um, terse and pithy as possible. Um, so I should, I should say, uh, in doing my graduate work at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, where uh, incidentally we're very fortunate to have um, Admiral Jim Stavridis as our dean. Um, he's been just a, a gift to the school. Uh, when I was doing my master's work uh, a few years ago, many years ago now, um, I was enrolled in the role of force uh, course because I was an international security studies uh, focused uh, student and I was learning all about uh, you know deterrence and compellence and coercion and all these things and at about the same time um, I attended the first ever film screening of a documentary film called A Force More Powerful and this is a documentary that chronicles about six historic nonviolent struggles over the course of history so it looks at the Gandhi-led uh, Indian independence movement, it looked at the Danish resistance to the Nazis, it looked at the Chilean nonviolent movement that ousted uh, dictator Augusto Pinochet, it looked at the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, uh, it looked at the Polish solidarity movement that um, ousted a communist tyranny, it looked at the U.S. civil rights movement. And I was watching this amazing uh, chronicling of uh, cases where unarmed people were uh, facing the most formidable opponents and using various nonviolent techniques and they were winning. And, and I remember just being kind of blown away at that point because we had been studying the meaning of force and the use of force and there was nothing in our studies about the role of nonviolent force and how organized people power can also wield significant force and power in the international system. So I was dedicated at that point at Fletcher to uh, writing my theses and dissertation on uh, the strategies of nonviolent resistance. 
And my real interest as someone who's not coming at this uh, phenomenon or thematic from a, um, from a pacifist perspective, obviously, I'm interested in the strategic dynamics. And so I was very much relying on asymmetric warfare theory and insurgency theory to try to understand when and how nonviolent movements or insurgencies succeed and when they fail. Um, so after I finished my dissertation at Fletcher, I was working for a few years in Washington uh, with an organization called the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. And that was an interesting experience uh, just because it allowed me to interact with activists and organizers who were involved in various campaigns and movements around the world. So on any given week, um, I would be meeting with Belarusian, Zimbabweans, even North Koreans, um, and hearing from their kind of um, testimonials of how they were trying to advance basic rights, freedoms, uh, and democracy in their country. So. Um, even after entering the U.S. government and the State Department, my, my thinking and my perceptions have always been informed and influenced by these stories and encounters with nonviolent activists from around the world. Um, so after that experience of working at ICNC, um, actually just towards the end of my experience there, we were hosting an academic conference out in Colorado. Uh, it was about people power and pedagogy, how to teach about this phenomenon of, of nonviolent resistance. And um, I met a young political scientist, Erica Chenoweth, who was attending the conference. Um, she was very skeptical about the role of nonviolent resistance, especially against the, the most difficult of opponents, and um, was kind of saying, ah, you mentioned the same 5, 10, 15 examples of nonviolent successes, but over the course of history, really, like this form of resistance, how effective has it been, really? Um, and the reality was no one had tried to systematically assess which form of resistance, violent or nonviolent, historically has been the most effective against the most formidable of opponents. So, so at the time, Erica and I were both kind of hearing the same uh, common claims. And I would note particularly amongst uh, security study scholars that you know, nonviolent resistance may have worked during the U.S. civil rights movement in a democracy. It can maybe work to advance women's rights in certain uh, places or environmental rights. But against the most uh, brutal opponents, if you will, those willing and able to use violent force against and repression against uh, protesters, uh, this form of resistance can't work. Um, or, you know, uh, in achieving major political objectives like challenging dictatorial regimes or foreign military occupations, uh, achieving uh, self-determination, that nonviolent resistance can't be particularly effective in these cases. Or um, Erica in particular was informed by an article that um, great political scientist uh, Max Abrams wrote in Foreign Affairs at one point where he said, you know, violence doesn't always work. He's done a lot of great um, empirical research on uh, violence and insurgencies and terrorism. He said, violence doesn't always work, but, but it works better than nonviolence. And so I think that more than anything was a provocation to fundamentally test whether or not this was true. So Erica and I, um, after we met, decided uh, that we would uh, fundamentally and systematically test the proposition um, that one form of resistance has been more effective than the other. So we collected data on close to 330 violent and nonviolent campaigns from 1900 to 2006. And so these were so-called maximalist campaigns. These were campaigns uh, challenging incumbent regimes, uh, challenging foreign military occupations, and those uh, vying for secession or territorial self-determination. Um, and there was a reason for choosing these categories of cases. A, we wanted to be able to compare cases, and also these were the cases that were considered the toughest, uh, the toughest test cases for nonviolent resistance. So we uh, collected this data, held, and I should note that to be included in the data set, um, a can first it needed to be a campaign. Uh, so this is a sequence of actions around uh, around a goal that takes place over time. So not isolated protests or, or acts of violence. So it's a campaign, first and foremost. And secondarily, you needed to have at least 1,000 observed participants to be included uh, in the data set. Uh, so we held constant variables that you would think 
um, would influence the outcomes of these campaigns. So we held constant GDP, um, military might, regime type, um, poverty levels, uh, divisions, uh, uh, ethno-sectarian divisions in society. And the somewhat counterintuitive finding, um, I think it's become more uh, intuitive now, is that the nonviolent resistance campaigns succeeded twice as often as their violent counterparts. So the nonviolent campaign succeeded about 53% of the time compared to 26% of the time uh, for violent. And just um, by way of, of definition, when I'm using the term nonviolent resistance or civil resistance, I'm referring to a method of prosecuting conflict that does not involve the threat or use of violence. It involves tactics like boycott, strikes, civil disobedience, satire, humor, sit-ins, street theater, hundreds of different, uh, different tactics. So uh, I should note that I avoid, I, I usually avoid the term nonviolence in these contexts only because nonviolence tends to connote either the absence of violence, plain and simple, or it connotes pacifism, and this came up during the, the first day, or pacifism, um, whereas I'm referring to very much an active method of prosecuting uh, conflict. And so, so that was the first uh, kind of major finding. And the other, another one was that the use of nonviolent resistance um, has increased uh, significantly over time, and it's become much more effective than violent resistance over time. Uh, so this one just looks at the onsets of nonviolent and violent campaigns. I um, mean, uh, the data set has been updated till, um, till 2014. Uh, and this one looks at the average success rate by decade. And you would note that um, Nonviolent resistance has uh, become more effective than, than violence over time, has proven to be uh, more successful. But you'll note here, let me make sure I got the right, you'll note uh, towards the end here um, a little bit of an interesting development. So the idea that within the past uh, half decade, so since the start of this decade, the, the relative, the overall effectiveness of nonviolent resistance has dipped to a level that we haven't seen since the 1950s. So we, Erica and I don't know if this is a durable trend or not, but it's somewhat disconcerting and you know, it, it does beg the question why. We can get into this later, but one hypothesis is that uh, authoritarian and dictatorial regimes are learning from each other very effectively. We all know there's such a thing as the dictator's handbook, but now it's actually easier for these regimes to meet one another, to, to uh, swap notes on surveillance, to share technologies on surveillance. Uh, so there's a lot of learning going on, and we think that it's possible that activists may be learning less efficiently, quickly than, than the regimes themselves. Did you want to ask a question? Yes, so d definition of success, uh, to be coded as a success, you needed to achieve the maximalist goal, which was uh, uh, incumbent regime le leaves power. So the removal of the incumbent regime, territorial secession, or removal of the foreign military occupation. Um, so pretty uh, straightforward goals. We have categories of success, failure, and mixed success as well. So we used a consensus approach to do the coding, relying on bibliographies, existing data sets, and the like. But those are, those are the, the definitions that we use. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. So this um, begs the natural question, why? Why has nonviolent resistance historically been so much more effective than armed struggle? Um, so Eric and I found that the single most important variable in determining the outcome uh, of these campaigns is the level um, and diversity of participation. So we found that the average nonviolent campaign in our data set attracted something like 11 times the level of participants as the average violent campaign. Um, and the reasons are probably evident. The moral, physical um, commitment barriers to participation are much lower in nonviolent resistance compared to armed struggle. So it was funny, I was uh, having a table conversation with someone earlier about the ethical barriers. Um, a minority of people in any society are going to be willing to kill other human beings for a cause. Um, and so anyone, basically, can participate in nonviolent resistance, young, old, men, women, disabled, able-bodied, um, rich, poor. So it, you know, 
there's not as high an ethical barrier of entry and also physical. So most armed insurgencies are dominated by young, able-bodied men. Um, they're not the sole fighters, of course, but they tend to be dominated by a certain type. Um, and the, the idea that everyone can participate in nonviolent resistance because the arsenal of tactics is, is so vast. There are hundreds of different nonviolent tactics available um, to, to people that, that can be used. My, so Erica, in a subsequent study, um, uh, came up with another interesting finding, which is that she, she found that there, um, no regime has stayed in power when 3.5% of the population has been engaged in active resistance. So that's an interesting stat. So numbers really matter. She calls it the 3.5% rule. Um, I think in the case of the US, the Women's March was our largest single day demonstration, I think, in history, according to data, and that was around 1.7% of our population, just to give you a, a sense of, of size. So um, why is participation so important in nonviolent resistance? Um, so this gets at the heart of, you know, how does nonviolent resistance actually work? Um, so this requires a certain understanding of the nature of power, and there are different models of power. So the first model, the monolithic model of power, uh, holds that all power resides at the top uh, of a regime or power holder. Uh, the rulers call the shots, they give orders, directives, and so power flows from the top down. Uh, so a different model of power, more of a pluralistic model of power, something that Gene Sharp really helped to popularize, is the notion that power actually resides in so-called pillars of support. So these are organizations and institutions that provide a regime or other power holder with the skills, knowledge, know-how, resources to stay in power. These pillars, and you think security forces, bureaucracies, educational institutions, media institutions, um, youth-led collectives, the like, that these pillars of support are comprised of ordinary people whose loyalties can shift um, and who's, uh, who may decide to withhold or suspend consent and cooperation. So bottom line, power is actually grounded in the consent and, con and obedience of ordinary people. If they stop paying taxes, uh, offering their labor, uh, offering professional advice, moving papers around as civil ser servants and bureaucrats, if they stop providing these forms of assistance, no regime, no matter how brutal, can stay in power. So it just requires kind of a fundamentally different uh, understanding of where power comes from. I would also note that actually one of my heroes in the field of civil resistance is retired Colonel Robert Helvey. So Bob Helvey, um, who lives out in West Virginia, uh, he wrote a monograph that you all can download for free online. It's called On Strategic Nonviolent Conflict. And Bob kind of popularized the notion of pillars of support. And his whole monograph is essentially about providing a strategic framework for analyzing regimes, where their power comes from, and what it means to erode, or in some cases, uh, fundamentally uh, dismantle those pillars of support, um, leading to, in some cases, a change of regime. So the idea that power flows from, from the bottom up. And another important element of participation, and this has come up actually a lot over the past couple of days, um, not surprisingly, is the idea that you're, you're much, the, the data found that you're much more likely to see the defections of security forces when they are faced with nonviolent resistance compared to armed struggle. And this makes sense because we discussed earlier that, you know, if soldiers or police are given orders to shoot at protesters and their, the participation is high, the chances that a family member or a friend or somebody who's socially close to that soldier or police officer, the chances that they'll be in the crowd and they'll be shooting at them is high. And so the, the likelihood of disobeying orders and in some cases defecting en masse is much greater when the resistance is nonviolent compared to armed. Armed resistance offers fuel for the, for the uh, justification to use more disproportionate force. 
Um, it kind of gives a green light to use violent repression, um, even you know intense violent repression against the dissidents. Um, and you're much less likely to win the moral high ground when you use armed resistance compared uh, to, to nonviolent struggle. And so this was a, was a, a significant finding in our research. Other researchers, Sharon Nepstad, Kurt Schock, have similarly found that nonviolent resistance correlates uh, to high levels of security force defections. And so uh, people often ask, well, what about you know, violent repression coming from the regime or opponent? Doesn't that influence the uh, effectiveness of violent or nonviolent resistance? Well, as you can see, um, first of all, repression targeting resistance is the norm and not the exception. Um, uh, Christian Davenport refers to it as the law of coercive responsiveness. Um, I think over 90% of the, of the campaigns in our data set featured some form of regime violence uh, targeting the protesters, yet nonviolent uh, resistance succeeds far more often than armed struggle when used against these um, oppressive opponents. And so then that raises the question, why? Uh, so first of all, the use of violent, resist violent repression against unarmed protesters is much more likely to backfire against the perpetuator. Um, so we're more likely to see uh, a regime, a government, lose support um, when they use uh, armed re violent repression against uh, protesters who are clearly uh, committed to, to nonviolent action. Um, this is both a domestic phenomenon and also an international phenomenon. You're much more likely to see strong international support for groups that are vying for human rights, self-determination, uh, democracy when they uh, use uh, nonviolent resistance compared to armed. And as I said earlier, it's far easier to justify the use of uh, counterviolence when faced with armed insurgents. And as, you know, uh, members, soldiers, members of the military, this is probably one of the most obvious things. If you're um, out on patrol and you're faced with uh, individuals who are obviously either shooting at you or throwing Molotov cocktails or, or rocks at you, your instinct and inclination is to fire back. Um, whereas, when confronted by you know, groups of unarmed protesters, it at least uh, makes you think twice before uh, firing at the crowd, if you will. So, so uh, repression is far more likely to backfire uh, when the resistance is disciplined and nonviolent. Also, um, no regime, no matter how brutal, can maintain uh, repression indefinitely, particularly when large swaths of the population are engaged in dissent. Um, and so this, um, this also, this idea of, of uh, repression becoming unsustainable underscores the importance for the nonviolent protesters of mixing up their tactics. So we found um, in the research that campaigns that were able to combine so-called methods of concentration, so think large demonstrations, um, rallies, tent cities like what we saw in Maidan, Tahrir Square in Egypt, so campaigns that uh, alternate between those methods of concentration and methods of dispersion, so think consumer boycotts in South Africa, think go slow tactics um, in different contexts, think stay at homes, things that are kind of harder uh, for regimes to crack down on. Being able to alternate between these methods of concentration um, and dispersion uh, uh, it, contribute to the effectiveness of, of nonviolent campaigns. I think my, my favorite example of this was um, in the Chilean struggle, so the nonviolent resistance against Augusto Pinochet, and one of the major pillars of support in that case was the copper mines and the copper miners. And so um, one of the tactics, it was going to be a major effort to call for strikes in the mines. Um, and so massive preparation was involved. The leaders of the strike learned that the regime was sending a significant number of soldiers, uh, security forces, to encircle and potentially um, actually go into the mines. And so the, 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 the challenge at, at that point was do we go forward with the strike and risk massive retaliation, violence against the workers, or uh, do we do something else? So the leaders called off the strike and they said instead, uh, every night, uh, we are going to have people go out into the streets and from their balconies bang pots and pans, so demonstrate mass dissent and solidarity, and we will walk slowly at a certain time every night. 
So everyone is out in the streets walking slowly. What do you do? Arrest everyone for walking slowly? Uh, it's very hard uh, to counter. So it was just an example of kind of changing tact uh, based on, on what, what the opponent was doing. Um, so in addition to kind of wanting to know which method of resistance has been more effective at achieving its short-term, kind of most immediate goal, um, a bulk of why civil resistance works actually focuses on the long-term effects of using one form of resistance or relying on one form of resistance over another. So we looked at, um, uh, at the effects of uh, resistance type on democratization, um, on levels of civil peace or civil war recurrence um, and the levels of atrocities uh, that were used over the course of, the, of an uprising. And so I think this is one of the most robust findings and it's been, um, it's been reinforced by about eight other independent studies is that civil resistance significantly advances democratization. Um, so, um, Celestino and Gledich, others have found that nonviolent protests significantly increase the likelihood of a transition to democracy. Um, in our study, we found that uh, nonviolent resistance was something like 10 times more likely to result in um, a democratic transition compared to armed struggle. Um, so, in, in another interesting a finding was that even in the cases that we looked at where uh, nonviolent resistance failed, and you know, of course, we don't make the case that nonviolent resistance always succeeds. It fails um, in about 25% of the cases. But we we were intrigued that even in the in the examples where the nonviolent resistance failed to achieve its goals or it was uh, repressed. So think Burma in 1988, a um, uh, popular uprising that was crushed by the junta. So even in these cases, we found that there was uh, strong levels of democratization within 10 years after the end of the campaign. So it was kind of a, an interesting finding and one that suggests that the, the skills inherent in building a nonviolent movement, negotiation, coalition building, uh, getting past differences, organizing, are skills that are also uh, helpful in building democratic societies. We also found that um, uh, you're much less likely to see recurrence to civil war uh, following nonviolent campaigns uh, compared to armed struggle. Um, this is probably evident. You come to power through violence. You need to stay in power um, often and uh, hold off opponents uh, that you've uh, kind of been combating with violence for a long time. So the idea that you need to keep an iron fist when you're in power following armed revolutions is somewhat intuitive. It was interesting, I uh, was meeting with a, a Congolese bishop at USIP not too long ago, and he was kind of, he started, when we were discussing the research and some of the findings, he started to list on his fingers the number of um, African presidents who had come to power following armed uh, insurgencies. So they had led armed insurgencies, became president. So he was listing them. And then he said, um, you know, basically all of them beca became more repressive and tyrannical than their predecessors. So they won, they, they achieved a toppling of the regimes, they took power, but the chances of uh, democratic consolidation after were very, very slim. And in fact, we found that less than 4% of rebel victories resulted in a democracies uh, five years after the end of the campaign. So I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes on the idea of the relevance of civil resistance in challenging non-state armed groups. A lot of the research obviously focuses on the role of nonviolent resistance and armed resistance for that matter against incumbent regimes. But what about cases where you're dealing with militias or paramilitary groups, narco um, actors? What is the relevance of nonviolent resistance in this case? So this is, a this is a newer, I would say, area of research and there's been great work done that has demonstrated first that um, active nonviolent organizing and in some cases nonviolent resistance has um, saved lives in the context of internal wars and civil wars. So one of the best books that's been published on this topic by Oliver Kaplan, um, it's called Resisting War. And Oliver, who's a Columbia specialist incidentally, he was trying to understand how it was that um, armed groups behaved differently 
and there were um, differences in civilian casualties um, and violence targeting civilians in different parts of Colombia. So he did a lot of field-based research, and one of his main conclusions was that the presence of autonomous structures that dealt with, um, you know, um, uh, resolving conflicts, uh, addressing disputes, um, you know, involved in these different aspects, but the, the presence of these autonomous self-organizing structures seemed to play a very, very important role in determining the level of violence that was used against civilians. Um, so there are interesting elements of nonviolent organizing, and we know other cases where nonviolent um, action has created or carved out peace zones in Colombia and other places. So it's just a way to think about, you know, even in the midst of hot conflict, nonviolent action can both nudge armed groups, so meaning change their behaviors, and also help carve out kind of safe spaces for civilians. Um, Erica Chenoweth and her colleague Evan Perkoski have also done some new and I think fascinating research on um, uh, the issue of mass atrocities. So when you see popular uprisings, violent, nonviolent, what determines whether uh, there are uh, mass atrocities committed? And I think the really interesting finding here is that they found um, that one of the most important variables um, in determining whether or not mass atrocities were committed against insurgents, whether violent or nonviolent, was the level of nonviolent discipline exhibited by the protesters. So um, it was very, very common for mass atrocities to occur over the course of kind of traditional armed insurgencies, but the maintaining nonviolent discipline mainly because it pro provoked security force defections um, and gave away excuses to use disproportionate violence uh, tended to save lives. So counterintuitively, it's actually safer to engage in nonviolent resistance against these type of opponents than it is to engage um, in armed struggle, safer, which was something, frankly, I would not um, have thought a few years ago. And then uh, kind, of, kind of finally on the issue area, this notion of terrorism and violent extremism. So uh, I've written a few articles actually on the relevance of civil resistance to, to the fight against ISIS and cited examples where in Raqqa, um, in Syria, and also in, in Iraq, in Mosul, and these are anecdotes, so uh, nothing generalizable, but there were incidents where uh, nonviolent protests led by credible, really respected local leaders, an imam um, in Mosul and um, uh, a very well-respected uh, woman in, in Raqqa. So these protests led to tactical victories. So for example, protests outside ISIS headquarters in Raqqa led to the release of political prisoners in one case in Mosul when the ISIS demolition unit came to destroy the crooked Minaret Mosque. Uh, the Imam and his uh, followers encircled the mosque, linked arms, and at least for that time being, the demolition unit went away. Now, not proposing that this is anything like a silver bullet, but I think it's worth studying cases where nonviolent resistance has this type of effect um, on these groups. Um, and also there is a very interesting case in Kenya where um, a bus that was filled with Muslim and Christian women was stopped by Al-Shabaab fighters. Um, traditionally, or um, most recently, Al-Shabaab had used mixed groups like this and had demanded that the Christians and the Muslims separate. Then the Christians were shot and killed summarily. Um, so that had happened previously. In this case, uh, the fighters boarded the bus, it's a well-documented case, demanded that the Muslim women separate from the Christian women. The uh, Muslim women responded by putting headscarves on the heads of the Christian women and kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, shifting around in the bus, refused to get up and separate from the Christian women and basically said, you'll either kill all of us or you'll leave. And they left. So I think the only uh, individual killed in that case was the driver who fled running and he was shot in the back. So kind of interesting micro examples of um, how civil re resistance can be used even against uh, kind of violent extremist elements. But beyond that, and the whole issue of, we, we talk a lot at, CV, at uh, USIP and beyond about 
um, what are options for countering violent extremism. A lot of focus on counter narratives, um, certainly addressing the root causes. And I think this is one area where uh, nonviolent resistance has a particularly important role to play because in most of these cases, uh, violent extremism is fueled by grievances, uh, things like bad governance, institutionalized discrimination, exclusion, um, and these are all areas where you know nonviolent uh, mobilization resistance can play a role in directly attacking those root causes of terrorism and violent extremism. And also, when you think about it, I mean, uh, extremist groups thrive on young people who are looking to join community to have a sense of identity and to have a sense that they're fighting injustices and so that they're resisting. If there were a nonviolent alternative, which there is, for them to join a community, express solidarity, have an identity, and be seen as fighting and feel that they're fighting for something greater than themselves, that potentially can serve um, as an antidote to terrorism and violent extremism. So this is the last slide. Um, just offer a few uh, final reflections on the implications of, of this research on the academy and also for policymakers, which is the community that I uh, am most associating with nowadays. Uh, so I think for scholars, just uh, the notion of where power comes from, its sources, the idea that power is grounded in consent and obedience, and that people, even in the most difficult environments, have more power than one would think from the outside. Um, and, you know, civilians are not only victims in some of these cases, they can have great agency, uh, particularly when they organize. Um, and there's more to nonviolent resistance than street protests. Uh, so there's a lot you can do, even in the most repressive of environments, that gets people involved, engaged, um, without making them entirely vulnerable to repression. Um, and it, you know, the research, I think, more than anything, um, pushed back to get against structuralist, uh, structuralist deterministic perspectives um, um, on, you know, uh, kind of work on, on conflict and in the political science community. The idea that agency actually matters um, and strategic choice matters and the choice of tactics and the use of tactics uh, definitely influences the outcomes. We did not find any structural variable, GDP, regime type, and the like. We did not find any st uh, structural condition that either impeded the emergence of a nonviolent campaign or its outcome. And that was actually a more surprising and counterintuitive finding for a lot of political scientists than the overall finding of, of effectiveness. So then for the policymaking community, and I, on, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis at the U.S. Institute of Peace, I'm thinking a lot about how do we think about and develop uh, nonviolent alternatives. Um, and I think, you know, just having pretty solid evidence that this is an effective way to wage struggle. It's an effective way for groups on the ground to address grievances, um, to advance rights, to challenge injustices, um, opens up a lot of possibilities for the policymaking community. And it suggests that there are, there are other ways to support insurgencies other than arming um, you know, the, the armed elements of, of these groups. There are other options. Um, what I'm researching now with Erica, we're uh, writing another book together on the role of external actors in influencing the trajectories and outcomes of nonviolent campaigns. So I think there are a lot of interesting things that policymakers can do um, both with funding, uh, grant funding opportunities, but also politically to amplify the voices of those who are leading nonviolent campaigns and movements in some of these incredibly difficult environments. And then I think for this group, probably the most important tool that I would flag is uh, uh, something that's developed by another admiral, uh, so another hero of mine in this space, Admiral Dennis Blair. Uh, Dennis Blair, a few years ago, I'm not sure if you all have heard of, that, of this book, but he wrote, um, it's more meant to be a handbook, um, and it's called, Influ it's called Military Engagement, Influencing Armed Forces Worldwide to Support Democratic Transitions. Because the reality is what security forces do in these environments is incredibly important to the outcome. So this handbook was not advocating democratic coups, rather it was suggesting the leverage that militaries have through IMET, through military education, through military exercises, even through the provision of, um, of weapons and equipment 
to influence the behaviors and mentalities of soldiers who are serving uh, in security forces in non-democracy, so in autocratic regimes. So I think um, if military engagement became kind of a, a bedrock of study um, at the different military institutions and at NDU, this could go a long way to informing kind of how a really, really critical pillar of support um, operates in these environments. So with that uh, little suggestion, I think I'll end it and take your questions. Thank you. Yes, please. Midshipman First Class Meyer, ma'am. Uh, I'm curious what the role of anonymity is in participation in nonviolent resistance campaigns and what something like China's ability to identify people in large crowds uh, very recently and how that will affect the space. Right. No, that's a great question. Um, I think in general on the whole area of social media, this came up yesterday, uh, we once thought that social media and new technologies would be a form of liberation technology for activists and dissidents. I think the verdict is entirely out and I actually think this is one area where repressive regimes do have a distinct advantage because they invest tons of money in surveillance technology and the like, censorship technology, to be able to pick out who the activists, the organizers are. So I actually think in many cases, um, you know, the balance is tilting in the direction of the regime when it comes to the, um, you know, the effectiveness of social media. And China is, is investing um, a ton of money in this area. I can't remember if um, what the re and this is one area, so for example, uh, my work on Syria, my last assignment in the State Department was working with the Syrian opposition. And I remember just being flummoxed when I learned that Blue Coat Technology, a US-based firm, was selling uh, essentially cyber suppression technology to the, to the Assad regime. And I was like, wow, you know, that's kind of unbelievable. So, you know, in terms of uh, surveillance censorship, it's a huge investment by regimes. In the China case, and uh, to your question about anonymity, I think in many cases um, there absolutely has to be some level of anonymity, particularly when people are just starting to get involved um, or they're interested in, in getting engaged. Um, it's kind of a necessity, particularly with online. Um, uh, organizing and mobilization um, offline as well, but it's just uh, obviously much easier to pick people off online. So I think it plays a really, really important role. And I think when it comes to demonstrations, this is a tricky one because um, the idea of countering this type of imaging and the like is very difficult. The one thing I would say is that at a certain point when the crowds become too large, um, that type of approach by the regime and technology becomes less effective than when it's a small group of individuals, so size matters. But also, as I mentioned, there are so many more tactics available to nonviolent um, resistors other than street protests and demonstrations. So in the case of China, I often ask myself, okay, there are going to continue to be localized protests around land disputes and the like across the country, but in order to build something bigger and something more connected, there's going to have to be a lot of underground organizing, building of coalitions, so all the unsexy elements of nonviolent resistance, if you will, that doesn't make it to the front page of the New York Times. So I think this is um, a key kind of tactical question for activists in a particular context, which um, tactics do we emphasize and use that's going to minimize repression and vulnerability of people, especially in these tough environments, that will get more people involved. And once you build confidence, you build trust, and you build numbers, that's when I think there's more protection around kind of public street level demonstrations and protests. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marie. I'm a great fan of your work, uh, and I think that uh, Nonviolent resistance is a part of asymmetric warfare that is very important. I want to ask you about the role of violence in nonviolent resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned backfire, and backfire we know can be very effective, but it seems to give the impression that nonviolent resistance often works best when it can provoke violence. We can look to the American Civil Rights uh, Movement in the 1960s, how in 1963 the black activists and civil rights leaders brought children to the front line in Birmingham and were able to reap enormous public relations benefits. We can look at hunger strikers who, who work through a kind of self-imposed violence 
And we can look at Gaza just a few hours ago, how over the last I heard four people were killed in what are supposed to be nonviolent violent, uh, demonstrations. But I'm sure the organizers know, having read your work, having read Gene Sharp, that if they can provoke violence to a significant degree, then the benefits and the uh, likelihood of success will increase yeah. through nonviolent resistance by provoking violence. So my question is twofold. How do you square the role of violence with the theory of nonviolence resistance, even strategic nonviolent resistance, and does this impose certain ethical obligations on the organizers, whether to use children, whether to provoke violence, uh, as they consider and balance what we call proportionality between the costs and the benefits of even nonviolent resistance? Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, that's a great question. So, you know, I think there are probably many examples in campaigns where the intent of the leaders is to provoke some type of counter response or violence in order to trigger what Gene Sharp referred to as political jujitsu, others have referred to as backfire. There also are huge risks associated with that strategy though, because on the one hand, it could work, the media covers the, the backfire, if you will, in the way that you want it to, um, and it leads to more people joining the movement out of outrage, bystanders, that's one possible outcome. The other is the violence is so harsh and uh, makes so many people frightened and fearful that they stay home and they don't join the protests. So I don't think it's automatic that the use of violence by the regime against nonviolent protesters is going to generate greater and larger protests. That does not always happen. Um, so there's always a risk associated. And, and I think, again, the goal at the end of the day is more people. The goal is not martyrdom in nonviolent resistance, it's gaining more people from different parts of society to engage in these various forms of political, social, economic pressure. And so I think um, if a leader and a strategist of a nonviolent movement goes in with their main mechanism being we're gonna trigger a violent response and that's how we're gonna win, it has serious moral problems associated with it and I don't even know that in many cases strategically it would work. Um, so, you know, so I, I think that's a very, dangerous proposition, which is not to say that it doesn't happen and that some leaders encourage it. But there are other ways to trigger jujitsu other than intentionally, for example, putting people out in the front lines or kids the other. Um, so anyway, there, there are definitely risks attached, attached to it. But at the same time, I'm the first to acknowledge that nonviolent resistance is not a risk-free method of struggle. People die. Um, the levels of people who die is so significantly less than an armed struggle that it's not even, you know, it's, it's hard to compare. But I think um, bearing in mind that there are risks associated um, in it places huge obligations on the leaders, um, ethical and then obviously strategic. And so in terms of the question of the ethical obligation when using nonviolent resistance, leaders that put people out in the front lines with no training no preparation, no sense that this will likely happen and here's how you can respond to minimize uh, the effects of repression, that is, I would consider that a completely immoral act. So just putting people out to be pummeled is a completely kind of immoral situation. The best and most effective nonviolent struggles involve profound elements of training, discipline, uh, planning, in the same way that armed resistance does. And that's one of the things I took away from the civil rights movement, the level of training and preparation for what they knew would be a harsh response, whether it was at the lunch counter sit-ins, whether it be the marches in Selma, they knew how to respond. It didn't always you know, r result in the way they would have wanted it, but people were prepared. So I think there is a moral, moral uh, obligation and also a strategic uh, necessity to prepare people to face the worst and not to choose tactics that make people super vulnerable before they're ready, prepared, and organized. So that would, just a couple points there. Yeah. So I'm very sympathetic to the argument uh, however, all the data establishes a correlation rather than causation, and I'm also concerned about selection effects. So, two questions. Number one, is it the case that once a nonviolent movement escalates to violence, that it, in the data set it moves to a different category? Because then, every time nonviolent resistance fails because of a lack of discipline, that all of a sudden gets recoded as violent resistance. Uh, my other concern is that nonviolent resistance rarely takes place without violent resistance alongside it in another organization. So the civil rights movement is an excellent example. Anyone who wants to res resist violently can siphon off from 
following Martin Luther King to following Malcolm X. And if you don't have that there as an outlet for violent resistors to siphon off to, is it more likely that nonviolent resistance is going to evolve into violent resistance because there's no place for the violent resistors to go? Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question. So on the coding, um, you won't be surprised that, especially Erica, who's much more <laughs> giving academic uh, talks, is, is asked about selection bias all the time. Uh, you know, there were multiple robustness checks run on this data to kind of deal with these effects. One thing I would say about the violent, um, nonviolent, it's true, probably the, the primary uh, objection to the study is that the nonviolent and violent campaigns are idealized. Um, and it's true. So um, there's been subsequent research to kind of pick out the, the independent effects of uh, tactic, you know, the tactical choice and the use of different tactics on the outcome. Uh, so I would flag Omar Wasau's work uh, on the U.S. and the effects uh, during the civil rights movement of where primarily uh, nonviolent tactics were used compared to violent and the effects that they had on voting patterns. Um, so how, uh, what people did when they went to the polls, significant findings. Um, also subsequent research by Erica and Kurt Schock uh, about the notion of mixing tactics or uh, having a radical flank. Uh, they found in the research that in the short term, um, kind of having a violent element or a radical flank increased uh, media attention on the struggle, so it brought some short-term positive results, got gained attention, but over the long term, it significantly decreased the participation uh, in the nonviolent campaign. So the average nonviolent campaign um, uh, with a violent flank is something like 17% smaller than the average nonviolent campaign without one. So this is in a study that Erica did with Kurt Schock in 2015. So I think there have been subsequent studies that have looked at those questions. Other researchers have found that because the, the addition of violence decreases the level of participation, that translates into uh, less successful outcomes. Uh, so these, and also, uh, I mean, you could imagine that increasing a violent element increases the likelihood of mass atrocities and mass violence being used against the population, as well as kind of distorts the, the cause uh, of the insurgent group. So anyway, there there definitely been uh, methodological tests to kind of look at that approach. But we, uh, and Erica especially, is the first to admit that this is is uh, a legit objection um, of, of the study, and also the idea that our outcome of interest, the success, so your first question, our definition of success is very uh, immediate um, and too narrowly defined, this kind of thing. That's why in the book we also were interested in the long-term effects of democracy, civil peace, this kind of thing. So anyway, there have been, um, over the past few years, some really good, strong uh, critiques, um, and uh, of course there's no such thing as a perfect uh, social science study. Um, but then your, your point about the channels for violent resistors, I think this is a really kind of interesting outlet. Um, first, during my work with ICNC, uh, every so often we'd meet an individual, whether from Burma or Zim, one of these places who uh, had been either a leader or else had been involved in armed resistance in their country. And for whatever reason, they came to the conclusion that it wasn't working, they didn't want to do it, so they wanted to, uh, to change tact and change approach. And so I often think that these individuals, kind of the former insurgents, if you will, have huge authority in these cases. So when they make the claim that we need to maintain nonviolent discipline as a strategic imperative, that tends to carry weight uh, in these populations. So A, I think, you know, the, the idea of having an, an alternate channel is really important. Uh, in <laughs> one example that I remember, the way that they dealt with the kind of more uh, enthusiastic armed guys in the movement was to give them, like, give them lots of different tasks. So, like, have them be, you know, what's the word when you, like, uh, reconnoiters, do you use this term? So, like, you know, give them jobs, like, have them dig holes and fill them up, like, whatever, just get them involved and give them tasks, and it tends to, not always, but it tends to kind of um, lessen their desire to want to engage in purely armed struggle. So leadership matters. Giving people alternative channels and outlets is really, really important. But I think also kind of how a nonviolent movement brands itself and how it presents itself to the public. One of my favorite stories from the Serbian Otpor movement. So this was a youth-led movement that in 1999 and 2000 um, mobilized the population in Serbia, which led to the nonviolent ouster of, uh, ouster of Slobodan Milosevic, the butcher of the Balkans when he tried to rig elections in 2000. 
The Serbian youth were some of the most savvy. Obviously, they used satire amazingly, and they kind of branded their movement. Everybody wanted to be a member of Oppor. So their, their, their symbol was the clenched fist. This actually came from like communist iconography and they passed. So they chose symbols and slogans that they knew would resonate with young people who were fed up with the status quo and who fully embraced militancy. Because you know, you can be a militant and engage in nonviolent resistance. So they just like gave people a path and a sense of identity and pride that kind of, I think, again, uh, helped deter the because there was a violent element in the Serbia case as well and at the end of the day it didn't become kind of um, bigger or more important uh, than the nonviolent movement so anyway I think your points are very very good though yes so it, it, it seems that for sort of US policy or other sort of outside uh, parties one one big implication is that if there's a case where there's kind of a, a fairly broad-based opposition movement, uh, if there's the risk of uh, that opposition turning violent, uh, either because of something the regime's done or because p p certain factions of the opposition favor, favor violence, the sort of implication is that for outside powers, something they should prioritize is to try to encourage the opposition to remain peaceful rather than becoming violent, rather than the violence escalating. So can you talk about some of the, the sort of the, 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 the things that the United States or other outside powers can do uh, in a situation that could turn violent to try to keep it peaceful? And I guess to, uh, to apply this to a concrete case, you know, Syria in 2011, for the first few months, from, from sort of March to the summer of 2011, a big part of the, the protests and the opposition were peaceful. And then after the summer of 2011, the sort of violence increases, more parts of the opposition became militarized, and the kind of insurgency grew over time. Is there stuff that the US or other outside powers could have done in 2011 to try to keep uh, the opposition to Assad peaceful rather than becoming militarized and then increasingly militarized as time went on? Yeah, those are, those are great questions. And just um, hopefully within the next couple of years, I'll have uh, you know empirical uh, data to share with you about the impact of different external interventions on the trajectories and outcomes of nonviolent campaigns. That's, that's the main focus of the, the new book with Erica. Um, so I think um, the role of outsiders is obviously tricky. Um, the one finding that we had from why civil resistance works related to outside actors is that we found a very strong correlation between the removal of patron support for regimes. Uh, so like U.S. Uh, saying time's up to Marcos, uh, time's up to the Shah in Iran. So there's a very strong positive correlation between the removal of patron support and nonviolent campaign success. So we did find that, fi we did have that finding in the book. We also found that there was no correlation between, and this was a very rough study, there was, um, this this was not a sophisticated element of why civil resistance works, but we found little evidence to suggest that direct state support to nonviolent activists and campaigns increased the chances of success. We did not find any evidence of that. We did find some evidence that non-governmental organizations, foundations and the like, that offered assistance in the way of material, like uh, informational materials, training, peer connection, that that helped the knowledge base of the nonviolent resistors and seem to correlate with, with success. But we hope to go much deeper in the, in the current research that we're doing. So I think about the question that you ask a lot. Um, I actually, uh, you know, when I left the academy at a certain point, I've been in policy positions ever since. My last assignment in the State Department was working with the Syrian opposition from Turkey. Uh, I deployed about a year into the revolution, so this was mid-2012. You could say already kind of too little, too late. Um, uh, and we were trying to support the nonviolent activists in opposition with uh, communications equipment, uh, with cameras, documentation material, some training. Um, even as a State Department person doing trainings in civil resistance was a little strange, um, but it was something that we tried to do uh, with the nonviolent opposition. Um, so I would, I, would, I would offer a few reflections on Syria because it is a good example. 
Uh, first, as I was saying to someone earlier, I think it's already a minor miracle that for nearly eight months the resistance uh, maintained nonviolent discipline or mostly nonviolent discipline. This is the toughest regime in the Middle East. Um, uh, the level of trust between Syrians was incredibly low. They had never engaged in these type of protests before. Um, so already it was kind of striking uh, that they engaged in resistance for so long. But I think the bottom line was they, um, time was not on their side. Uh, one uh, kind of stat I should have noted earlier, the average nonviolent campaign in our data set uh, took three years to run its course. Seems like a wicked long time. The average violent campaign in the data set, nine years. So non <laughs> we often hear, we, we wanted to work more quickly, faster, that's why we got to take up arms. No, there's no, like no evidence to, that suggests that your resistance is going to be any shorter in duration. Um, but the case of Syria, you know, the, the um, resistance was kind of um, um, overshadowed by Free Syrian Army activities within about eight months. Um, you know, everyone on the outside started picking their favorite faction of the, of the FSA and other kind of armed groups and providing weaponry. And I think once weapons started flowing in from all sides, it was really, really hard, uh, you know, certainly for the nonviolent resistance to have much influence and to kind of um, inform that, that trajectory. So in terms of what could have been done, um, you know, I think, uh, uh, it's, it's very difficult because I think Syria was in many cases a worst case scenario and I'm honest with myself and I, and I think yes, if we had supported the nonviolent opposition maybe with more money, maybe that would have made a difference. I'm not convinced of that. I think to myself, well, was there too much emphasis on the external Syrian opposition coalition? Um, you know, should have been more, but our, our aim was to try to connect the opposition inside Syria with the Syrian opposition coalition. That was very, very difficult to do. Um, I, I think um, if there had been a way to kind of uh, in, kind of <laughs> pressure the security forces in some way, maybe not our um, defense department, but if other militaries had been able to somehow put pressure at certain points, maybe that would have made a difference. But really, when the guns started flowing in and when the Free Syrian Army made the strategic choice to set up a base in Turkey and to wage armed insurgency, that just fundamentally changed the trajectory of the conflict. Whether or not it was inevitable is open for debate, but I think that was very difficult to come back from. So had there been a way to kind of engage Free Syrian Army soldiers in a way that would have made the nonviolent resistance primary, and how could these defected soldiers support the nonviolent resistance rather than vice versa? That would have been an interesting, I think, possibility. Um, but it was very, very hard to turn back, I think, after that. So had there been a way to prevent like the flood of weapons and to engage FSA folks in a different way, it may have made a difference. But I'm not, I'm not rosy. Um, eyed about or dewy eyed about the prospects of uh, nonviolent resistance succeeding, but the idea that violent resistance had a better shot than nonviolent resistance against the Assad regime, I think, is also incredibly misguided. Yeah. I'm going to have us stop there so we hit our timeline. Thank you, Maria, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And uh, I think you would agree that if she leads a civil resistance movement, we're behind her because she's uh, very, very <laughs> convincing and very enthusiastic. And again, great to think about for military policy leaders and those who are educating those that are going to move up, how to think about this. It really is very, very important. So I don't know at the, um, the U.S. Institute for Peace whether you can wear this cover or not, but no, I, 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 uh, you, you can wear, wear it off duty. She actually, she actually said there's both an Army and a Marine uh, intern there that gets to be a fellow for, I guess, probably a year or some, something like that. Oh, no, they're lieutenant colonels. Yeah, so, so I, I think, well, I mean, with you guys, though, for a year at the, at the Institute. So she'll, you know, she'll be showing some favor of having uh, this cover. So, again, thank yeah, you, thank you very much. so much for being with us.